Well, I think both. I think I think the Democrat Party has clearly showed their true colors during the Democrat convention. I mean, the the language that came out of the the platform committee was the true reflection of what the committee and the party uh, wanted to say with regards to Israel and the Middle East. Namely, and there were there were three main issues that were really bad for Israel. One was they took Jerusalem as the capital of Israel out of their language. They put it back in when they saw the public public relations nightmare that was coming out, coming down the, the road. But worse. They took out language that recognized Hamas as a terrorist organization or, and calling on Hamas to renounce terror before being able to enter a peace agreement with the, the, the Israelis. And they also took out language that prevented the idea of Palestinians from claiming refugee status and returning to Israel and settling in the land of Israel after a peace agreement was made. These three things are devastating for the state of Israel. And the Democrat Party, clearly the true reflection of the party was what came out of the, the platform committee. It's uh, George, uh, George Birnbaum. He is the former uh, chief of staff under Benjamin Netanyahu in Israel. Uh, let's dial it back a little bit. Sure. Let, let's uh, because you know, uh, the, the, uh, I, as much as I understand where you're coming from, and, and probably most of, of who's listening understands where you're coming from. Let's dial it back a little bit and let's look at uh, the actual situation in the Middle East. Um, at one point under Bill Clinton, ninety-seven percent of what the Palestinians wanted was offered to them. Ninety-seven percent, and Arafat turned it down. Um, Bill Clinton wanted that to be his legacy and not the fact that he was impeached, and he failed at getting it done. Um, the Palestinian complaint was, Israel's offering us 97%, but it's a piece over here and a piece over there, and it's still be occupation this. And a, George, do you think the Palestinians really want to broker a deal where there can be two states there, or do you think they just want the whole thing? No, I, they want the whole thing. I mean, it's clear that, listen, I, your listeners who are businessmen and lawyers and, and even people in, in personal relationships understand that negotiations are about giving and taking. And I can't imagine any person who listens that would go into negotiation and get 97% of what they're asking for to walk away from that. Am now, I right on that number? Wasn't it 97%? It was about 97%. I mean, it was, it was, it, Ehud Baraki was the prime minister at the time, right. and, and he literally gave uh, Yasser Arafat, who was at the time the chairman of the Palestinian Authority, about 97, 98% of all they were asking for. The, the 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 message that I think most Israelis got, I think the Americans to some degree, even Bill Clinton, was that um, at the end of the day, what the Palestinians want and what the Arab world wants is a Middle East without Israel. Um, there's no, there's no. I don't think there's any misunderstanding in in what their final intentions are. And, and let me ask you this: um, when it comes to the situation uh, in that region. Um, Many people are saying, well, that was always Palestinian land. Mm -hmm. That was always where, it, biblically, it was called Philistine. For my money, it used to be Egypt, and it originally was the Holy Land. That's why we, a Judeo-Christian nation, have always been been great friends with Israel, and that's why we sort of helped you guys get back there, um, you know, uh, back after the war. I mean, at the end of the day, um, the argument seems to be about who was there first. And, and, right. and, and then the argument continues to, well, it's all about geography, and oh, by the way, the religious aspect doesn't help either. What's the real fight? Is it both geographic and and religious, or is it one one over the other? I think it's mostly religious. I mean, the fact of the matter is we can argue history, but uh, the land wasn't called uh, Palestine or, or Philistine. It was called uh, Canaan uh, back in the Bible. Um, it was only after the, the Romans uh, 2,000 years ago uh, destroyed the Second Temple and kicked the Jews out of uh, out of the land of, uh, of Israel uh, that the Romans used the nomenclature uh, a Palestine, right. uh, and something that the British adopted later on, many centuries later. In any case, uh, you can argue the history. What, you, what, what we know for a fact, and you can anyone who visits Jerusalem today uh, can can go and see a lot of mosques, and pretty pretty sure that underneath every one of those mosques lies the ruins of either a, a synagogue or a church. Right. Um, and I, I would tell your listeners that if you were to be in, walking around Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, when Jesus was walking through the streets of Jerusalem, uh, the thing he saw on, on, on Mount Moriah, the, the Temple Mount, uh, was not a church. I mean, he had not died yet. He had not died on the cross yet. Christianity didn't exist. He certainly didn't see a mosque, because right. Islam hadn't existed yet for another 700 years. He saw one thing, the Temple of the Jews. Um, that's indisputable. And so uh, I, I think it's a mostly religious battle. Um, it, it certainly, if you read Mark Twain's writings from uh, a few hundred years ago, a hundred years ago, when he was walking through Palestine, he said Palestine was a wash in ash and sackcloth. No one cared about the land. 
only one people cared about the land, the Jewish people. It took 2,000 years to get back there, uh, and it was only in 1967 that Jerusalem as a city was reunited. And ever since, freedom of religion has existed in Jerusalem under, the, under, under Israeli rule. Jews, Christians, Muslims can worship their holy sites, something that didn't exist prior to 1967. Right. Um, that, and those are the facts. It's uh, George Birnbaum. He is the former chief of staff under Benjamin Netanyahu, and, and he's got a very loud wonderment that I wonder as well, uh, what's going on with the Democratic Party in America and what's going on with this administration? Uh, one of the first forays by President uh, Barack Obama was to go to Cairo, Egypt, and to hold a, a, a speech where he pretty much said Muslims created the entire world. I mean, he, it was an odd speech where he, they created paper and pens and, and uh, space travel and cars and, and just uh, uh, delicious fruit. I mean, without Muslims, we would have nothing, George, is basically what I took from that, uh, that conversation. I checked it out. As the bird flies, um, it's about 250 miles or so to Jerusalem from where he was. Uh, he didn't go. Uh, what did that tell Israel? What did that tell you when he made that trip? Well, I, you know what was more important was what, what he said in Cairo. He basically said, I'm sorry. He apologized for decades of U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. And the problem there is the perception. And I'll, I'll just, a little aside, a little story. When Mr. Netanyahu was first prime minister back in the 90s, um, he went to go visit Germany, which was very symbolic for a Jewish prime minister to visit the German head of state, Chancellor Helmut Kohl. Right. At the beginning of the meeting, he was called out of the meeting because some riots had started in Jerusalem. The Palestinians had started some riots. Eighteen soldiers had been killed. Literally ten minutes into this first meeting with Chancellor Cole, he excused himself. He walked out of the room. He got in his car. He called the Chairman Yasser Arafat, and he said, Mr. Chairman, I'm back on my way to Israel. I'll be in my plane in 30 minutes. If the riots haven't stopped in 30 minutes, I'm rolling my tanks into Ramallah. Right. Within 15 minutes, the riots had stopped. The reason was it. The reason for that was Yasser Arafat and others thought Benjamin Netanyahu was crazy enough to use the strength of the Israeli military. Right. In 1979, Carter couldn't release the hostages. The hostages were only released. The American hostages in Iran were only released after the election of Ronald Reagan, before the inauguration of Ronald Reagan. Right. Because they saw in Ronald Reagan it was the same army that that Reagan was inheriting from Carter. But they saw in Reagan someone who would be crazy enough to use the force the, the American military to free those hostages. What Barack Obama did in Cairo was send a very clear signal to the entire Arab world that he would never use the full force and strength of the U.S. military to defend Israel or other U.S. interests in the Middle East. Oh, and by, the, was, and by the way, why do you think Iran was in check for eight years under George W. Bush? Because Iran felt that George W. Bush was crazy enough to, to, to annihilate them if they tried anything. Absolutely. So the, the, besides the symbolism of, 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 of Barack Obama not taking a, a half-an-hour air, airplane trip to Jerusalem after visiting Cairo, but the fact that his first foreign policy speech was to send a signal to the Arab world that, don't worry about it, I'm not going to use the full force of the American military to defend our allies' interests, was the worst possible diplomatic mistake any president in the modern era could have made. George Birnbaum, uh, Israeli expert, former chief of staff under Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, the president has not gone back to Israel since he's been in office. We can talk about that in a moment. I don't have a ton of time left, uh, but but I wanted to ask you about what's happened in um, in in the Muslim world. You've got um, um, Egypt, where you had Mubarak had a peace accord with Israel. The Muslim Brotherhood has now taken over a radical Islamist group, and the military has taken over. They said we have no peace accord with Israel. Yemen is up in arms. Libya has been handed to been handed to the Muslim Brotherhood basically. Uh, nobody knows what's going to happen in Syria. The entire region is blowing up. And do you think that's a direct response to their, their feeling that Barack Obama supports them, or their feeling that Barack Obama would never stop them? Well, you know, the, let me say that uh, Islamic fundamentalists are quite smart, and they saw a weak U.S. president. And the Arab Spring had nothing to do with democracy. It had to do with a legitimate power grab by Islamic fundamentalists using democracy to get that power. Do you think Obama knew that, though? The whole world knew it. Anyone, anyone, I mean, it was very clear to see that was happening. If, if you didn't see it, you were blind. And, and that, if that's the case, if Barack Obama and the State Department and Hillary Clinton weren't able to recognize that, we've got a much bigger problem. Well, I think it begs the question, why would he support the uprising in those countries where he knew that a radical group would take over, but he, didn't, he did not support the uprising by, by those looking for, for freedom and liberty in Iran? It's, an, it's exactly the right question to ask. And what, we, what the result is now is that we've created six or seven 
satellite states of Iran, proxy terror nations for the Iranians, by which the Iranians can transfer weapons, can transfer technology, and the isolation that Israel is living under now is as great, if not greater, than they did in 1948 when the country was founded. It's a direct result of this administration claiming and supporting the Arab Spring with a democracy movement when all it was was an Islamic fundamentalist power grab. It has been a disaster for Israel. Last question, George Birnbaum, the former um, chief of staff under Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, if any Jew were, were to feel inclined to vote for Barack Obama again, any message for them? Well, I just think any, any, any American who understands that Israel is America's canary in the coal mine. But I just, I, just, I just have to interject, George. You're a smart guy. You sound like you're, you're way on top of things. There are American Jews who are still planning to line up and blindly vote for this guy, and I can't wrap my brain around that. Any message directly to them? If you care about Israel and you care about the faith of the Jewish people, you cannot vote for Barack Obama with good conscience. It's that simple. That simple. I said last question. This really is. Did he really disrespect Netanyahu and make him wait like an hour in the waiting room? Did that really happen? Um, I don't know the exact length of time, but uh, I think it would. I think I think the way things took place, it was inappropriate to treat a head of state that way. Crazy. Yeah.